first, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here. I know that's going to be a very exciting speech or presentation, I should say. Uh, I also would like to let you know I represent with Bruce Root, who is here, uh, Nasser, which stands for National Association of Armenian Studies and Research, which also depends on uh, donations <laughs> and membership. So I urge you to think about that because we're, we're all volunteers putting on these, including Maggie, who is running around here for, with the museum. Uh, but uh, the other material things that we need some uh, support. Uh, also, I wanted to say a few words. As you know me, I don't let the moment go by not to say a few words that uh, might be possibly pertinent to today's talk. Lately, I've been doing some research on post-traumatic stress disorder which has been in the news, as you know, because as the Iraq war ended, so-called, uh, we are getting all these uh, men back from the front, and uh, a lot of them are not affected physically, so to speak, but are being affected or have been affected with post-traumatic stress disorder. This is not a new uh, illness. It has been around for a long time, as long as men have been fighting, but since now we can annihilate people with just a push of the button, uh, wars have become more deadly. It used to be called shell shock or battle fatigue in World War One and II. I'm pointing at Puck in there. Uh, but now it's more complicated so it's a mouthful, post-traumatic stress disorder, so we call it PTSD. So the question is, what is it? It is basically an anxiety disorder that one experiences after a traumatic event with a threat of injury or death, and has to last for 30 days or longer. What are the situations it occurs under? It's associated with assault domestic abuse, prison stay, rape, terrorism, and war. Of course, genocide we included as part of terrorism that is uh, brought on by one's own government, own government, on its own minority. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> okay. Uh, the, what are the symptoms of PTSD? There are three major uh, parts. It, it's called reliving, which has to do with flashbacks and uh, upsetting memories, nightmares, a strong reaction to events, avoidance, which is emotional numbing, lack of interest, feeling detached, and feeling of no future, almost like depression. And the third major component is arousal, which is difficult in concentrating, hypervigilance, outbursts of anger, and insomnia. PTSD is associated with alcohol abuse, depression, and panic attacks. Now, do you remember? I'm sure some of you are, uh, have, mem have had members who have genocide survivors. Do you know of anybody you know of who experienced these symptoms? Show of hands. One or two, okay, but not that many. I expected more. <laughs> because I have one, my father. Ah, one more, okay. If you remember others after the talk, please come and see me. Okay, the reason why I'm saying this is that there's been additional recent research that shows that PTSD is associated with genocide and Holocaust. There has been, of course, studies most with Holocaust survivors, but also has been recently studied with uh, Bosnia, uh, Cambodia, you name it, all these genocides. 
most common thing that I have seen while reading uh, memoirs of Armenian genocide survivors are the nightmares, reliving of events, and reluctance of retelling them since it brings forth visual images of atrocities. I remember people saying, I don't want to tell you about it because it's right in front of my eyes and I cannot tolerate it. Now, there is additional research that shows that PTSD is associated with changes in our DNA. These are chemical changes excuse me, that come about due to stress. Now, the stress can be any type of stress, as we mentioned as others. We also, it can involve um, um, uh, uh, being uh, without food under additional uh, physical or emotional stress. What they have found out is that the DNA basically does not change because these chemical changes affect the expression of the DNA that we have, which affects the way we do things, our behavior, and so on. This has been shown to be transmitted from one generation to another. Mm -hmm. So if you are a person whose uh, father or grandfather was involved in genocide, then you might be affected also with PTSD. People who have PTSD have lesser ability to put up against stress. Their body does not respond well. But basically they inherit it from their mother. And that's been shown including while the mother is pregnant at the time of the stress. There is a lot of research to prevent PTSD and also try to reverse it. Obviously, we do not have the time today to talk about that, and it can be another topic for extensive discussion. Okay. Now, maybe after you hear Dr. John C. talk about Arman Manukian, you wonder, does PTSD, did PTSD involve this person or affect his life? Professor John Seed he teaches art at Mount San Jacinto College. He has degrees from Stanford and Berkeley. Initially, the family thought he was going to follow in his family's footsteps going to law but he decided that he was more excited about art and art history and teaching, uh, which has been a plus to us Armenians. We need more men like John C. He has won the 2002 prize, Award in Arts and Entertainment Writing by the Society of Professional Journalists. He has written about Manukyan in the Honolulu Magazine, Fragile Paradise. In addition, he has written in Yerevan Magazine, Harvard and Star Stanford Magazines, Maui no Kaiori, The Armenian Reporter and Huffington Post. He has published two books, Nine Artists and Arman Manukian, and An Armenian Artist in Hawaii. The latter will be available for purchase after the lecture. I personally want to express my gratitude and appreciation to him for a diligent research into our history dealing with this artist's life. As I mentioned, we need more people like him to publicize and preserve our history and culture. Uh, what I'd like to do today, I'd like to start my lecture with just a story. I want to tell you how I found out about uh, Armand Manukian. Also, I should check. Janet, how's the sound in the back? A little more sound. A little more. Here we get more sound, but no feedback. Mm -hmm. okay. Testing, is that better? Yeah. Yeah. One, one, one more. All right. Uh, Twelve years ago, I was in an antique store in uh, Dana Point, California, which uh, my projector just went to sleep. 
and I bought a painting from the Philippines and uh, resold it on eBay. When I sold it, one of the men who bid on it got in touch with me and said, I'm an art dealer and I specialize in paintings from the Philippines and Southeast Asia and also Hawaii. And we started an email friendship. We're, we're still in touch 12 years later. And about two years into the friendship, he mailed me a check. He said, I'm sending you $1,000, and what this is for, I would like you to find out who Armand Manukian was. He said, because here in Hawaii, this man is a legend. And he said, we know practically nothing about him, but we have maybe 20 to 30 paintings, and the paintings are extremely expensive. He said, they often go for six figures when they show up. They're very, very rare, and uh, we know practically nothing about him. So I got involved in this and did research for about six months, and, and I came up with very, very little myself. You know, most of the people that had known this man were dead, and there was very little information. I, I didn't have much to go on. And then the Marine Corps Archives in Washington sent me a letter, and the letter had the name of Manukian's nephew living in France in the letter. And Manukian was spelled differently. It was O-U-K-I-A-N. And these were the new days of Google. The search engine Google had just started. I put the name into Google and found out that the artist's nephew was a member of a chess club in Herblay, France. And to make a long story short, through that chess club, we got his cell phone number. And a French professor at my college called him up. And this is what happened. He got him on his cell phone on the road to Paris for a business meeting. And he took this phone call and he said to my friend, he was, he was silent on the phone. He said, how on earth did you get my cell phone number? He says, no one has spoken about my uncle for 35 years. It was just like a, a haunting experience for him. But eventually, another friend of mine met him in Paris and he gave an interview about the family and that's where my research really took off. And that's where today's presentation comes from. I've been working on Manukian for about 12 years and you know, a couple of times a year something new arrives. All right, so who was Armand Manukian? You're looking at a picture of him in his mid-20s, a few years before he took his own life. And that's a quote from Ron Ronk, who was a newspaper reporter in Honolulu that did some research on Manukian in the uh, 1990s. And in his article, he called Manukian a meteor. He says his death wave uh, 27 at the age of 27 sent shockwaves through the community. And when I spoke to Ron on the telephone early in my research, he said people still talk about it. He was legendary, but they knew very little about him. One of the things I found out in my research is that the best Manukian paintings belonged to a single collector, and that man didn't know that Manukian was Armenian. And he knew nothing uh, about him. So I started with old headlines and found this headline from the Honolulu Star Bulletin. And by the way, Manukian had been a newspaper artist. He had worked for this newspaper in the mid-1920s. Uh, and I read the story of his uh, suicide. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later in the presentation. And began following the, uh, the trail of his life. When I visited Honolulu, I also uh, found the home where he had taken his life. He lived, uh, was renting a room downstairs in this home at Black Point. And just after I made this visit, the home was completely remodeled. So it doesn't look like this anymore. But it really looked very ramshackle, looked very much like it must have in the, uh, in the late 1920s, early 1930s. All right, here's the story, and I'm going to unwind the story beginning with what his family was able to tell me. Uh, Manukian came from a family of, we'll call them Europeanized uh, Armenians. Uh, they were in Constantinople, but they had family business connections in Manchester, England, and also in Marseille, France. And I had to learn about Constantinople to kind of uh, give myself a feeling for this research. And I found these old uh, postcards on eBay that let me kind of look at Constantinople before the, uh, the genocide. Uh, there's so much to say about that city, and, and I think you know more than I do. So I'd better be careful not to pretend to be an expert. But for example, looking at that fantastic uh, Galata Bridge, they say nearly 150,000 people passed over that bridge every day you know, often carrying things on their back, like this uh, porter. And of course, in the period where the Sultan ruled, which, and that ended in 1909, uh, the last Sultan was apparently very, very paranoid. And uh, he was worried that uh, electricity was somehow connected with dynamite. So there were no telephones in this uh, major city. 
uh, you know, no trolley cars, and uh, there were no rubber wheels allowed on the pavement of Constantinople. So it was a, a city with this uh, huge population. There were nearly 200,000 Armenians at the turn of the uh, century. Cosmopolitan city, many, many Europeans there. It was a crossroads, of course, uh, between uh, two continents. It had a tremendous ancient history. And in a magazine interview that he gave in the 1920s, Manukian said, he said, he didn't say I'm from Constantinople, he said, I'm from Byzantium, <laughs> the capital of the ancient Roman Empire. And that was how he described his uh, birthplace. I don't have any photos of Manukian as a very, very young man. His family does have a few drawings that he made. And I'll talk about those drawings in a minute. But I found on the internet, there's a picture of a uh, Armenian boy with his mother from about the same era. And I also put a photo of a newspaper office there to kind of cue into the fact that uh, Manukian's father, Arshak, was a newspaper publisher. Uh, going back, the Manukian family had been a very, very wealthy family in the 19th uh, century. They had uh, connections with the Gulbenkian family. Uh, they were traders and merchants. And Manukian's father was educated at Oxford. So very definitely an you know, upper class, very, very well-educated uh, family. One of the memories that apparently young Armand had, and we know this because his family has drawings of ships, is made a tremendous impression on him in early 1909 when the Great White Fleet of the Americans, sent by uh, Teddy Roosevelt, came into the harbor at Constantinople. And we're going to learn that a big part of his imagination had to do with ships and travel, going back to that uh, experience. So in his early years, just to set the stage for a little bit of history, we know that Armenians in the Ottoman Empire had a very, very difficult, very troubled history through the uh, 19th century. And I understand that Manukian's father, uh, for fear of his safety, actually spent a fair amount of time in France while young Armand was growing up. And apparently the family also had relatives in Egypt and traveled to uh, Egypt. But in around 1908, 1909, uh, when the new Young Turks first appeared, the Armenian intellectuals were very excited. It was a little bit like how the Spanish came, the Spanish felt about Napoleon before he actually arrived in, in Madrid, you know, before things turned bad. They were excited. They thought that the, the new constitutional government was going to offer them opportunities. And it was a very, very good time for newspapers and magazines. And I've heard that there were something like 50 Armenian publications in Constantinople at this time. So Manukian's father uh, returned from France, and even though there were massacres in 1909, there was still, underneath the chill of that, there was a kind of optimism about the uh, future. And because of that, the intellectuals in Constantinople had a very, very serious discussion about Armenian culture and what could Armenian culture become, and they especially were interested in the idea of what is the Armenian spirit that's carried through history. So that's the setting in which young Armand, and, and I have to tell you, his name was not Armand. His name was Tateos, uh, and he was called Tati as a boy. So he was named for one of the two uh, apostles that are so revered by the uh, Armenian Protestant church. Later, he changed his name to uh, Armand. So uh, in this early period, he attended the school of the St. Gregory the Illustrator Church in uh, Constantinople. And the principal of that school is someone whose name you may recognize. Uh, Daniel Verugin was one of the major poets of uh, the early 20th century in Armenia. He was also a leader to the Turks, a ringleader, of the Mehian movement, which was this movement for a kind of Armenian renaissance uh, in literature, in art, in uh, drama. And I have a statement here that he made, which gives you a feeling for the nationalism and the pride that was part of his uh, spirit. He says, we announce the worship and the expression of the Armenian spirit because the Armenian spirit is alive but appears occasionally. That was a diplomatic way of talking about the oppression. We say, without the Armenian spirit, there is no Armenian literature and no Armenian artist. Every true artist expresses his own race's spirit. And reading that now, I, I think to us it may sound old-fashioned or maybe too nationalistic, but I read it as being very, very sincere 
and I read it as a key to being a way of understanding the artist that I have been uh, studying. And I also, in studying uh, this man, I can't get out of my mind one line of his poetry. I think about this when I think about Manukian. He said, uh, the, Armenian, uh, the Armenian nation weeps and rages in me. So on uh, April 24th, the world was very, very distracted. Uh, the battle at Gallipoli b began on this same day. And again, you know the history better than I do. But on April 24th, when uh, Tateos was just short of 11, 200 uh, very, very carefully chosen patriarchs, you know, male uh, leaders, were uh, gathered up and they met various fates. Uh, some were imprisoned. Uh, others were executed, others were tortured and executed, and then others were deported uh, in, in a series of forced, mar forced marches into the uh, desert. And I've heard two different stories about how the principal of Manukian's school died, uh, and I can hardly bear to say what they were, but I will. Uh, in one version, he was slowly stabbed to death, and his screams were heard. In another version, his head was crushed between two rocks. Mm -hmm. So whichever version is, is right, he met a terrible death. And before the presentation, uh, Holly, who drove all the way from uh, Orange County, was asking me, do I know much about what young Tateos saw between 1915 and 1920 when he left for the United States? And the answer is no, I don't. Because in the interview with the family, they told me what they wanted to told me, tell me and I didn't really press beyond that. But let's say that from the age of 11 to the age of uh, 16, when he left and uh, came to the United States via Ellis Island, we know that there were public executions in uh, Constantinople. We know that there was a terrible political pressure. And by the way, his father and uncle survived on April 24th. They were being sought on that day, but they hid in the family uh, printing company. But Manukin's father, left for France and then died of the Spanish flu in uh, 1917. Mm -hmm. So young uh, Armand would have associated that day really with the loss of his father, eventually with his father's uh, death. So with uh, uh, Armand was the young, he was the oldest boy. He had a younger brother and a younger sister with a large sum of money given to him by his uh, mother. At the age of 16, he came to Providence, Rhode Island and he lived with relatives, my research shows that his uh, uncle had an umbrella repair shop in Providence, uh, Rhode Island. And of course, uh, you know, for someone like Manukian, he had not only undergone all of the trauma of his teenage years, but the family had lost their business and had lost a lot of their resources. And, you know, Rhode Island was flooded with impoverished Armenians. Mm -hmm. Many of them worked at the Hood rubber plant, which is no longer uh, operating and the economy was very, very weak in this time, so it was a you know, difficult situation all around. But uh, he got a scholarship, uh, and by the way, I have this here because he lived at the YMCA before he lived with his uncle. He got a uh, state scholarship to study at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, Manukian's father knew lithography well, being a newspaper man, and eventually his uh, younger brother, Vahe, became a lithographer. And at one point, Manukian called himself a, a lithographer. So he was very, very good in illustration and printmaking. And he studied commercial art in, in Rhode Island. And this is the first beginning of his uh, career. He really had this ambition not to be a fine artist, but to be a uh, commercial artist. And he was trained at the Rhode Island School of Design. He also went into New York City and took classes at the uh, Art Students League. And that's a place where you can take classes almost on a walk-in basis. You could maybe have a job during the day and then draw the model at night, only come one or two days a week. But he apparently attended some classes there and had very, very good training. Uh, the family says he was always writing home about winning art prizes, sending home you know, little uh, newspaper clippings. So things changed for him in uh, 1923 when he joined the Marine Corps. And I'll go forward one and then I'll come back. That's the first photo I have of him, his uh, boot camp photo in 1923. And he wasn't very tall, I think he was maybe 5'4 or 5'5. Five five. And you can see with uh, losing his hair for the military, his ears stick out <laughs> fairly far. But he became, he wrote to his uh, mother, who was in France at that point, 
and he said, I've joined the Army of the Navy. And that's how he explained the Marines to his uh, mother. He had apparently always had a fascination with the U.S. military after seeing the, uh, the Great White Fleet. And he was taken under the wing of this man, uh, Edwin McClellan. Edwin McClellan was writing a history of the Marine Corps. And by the time it was finished, it was an 800-page book that he was writing. And he found out that this man, Manukian, was an illustrator, took him into his, my office, his office and said, I'd like you to be my secretary. And he became kind of, uh, McClellan became like a mentor to Manukian for the next four years of his career. Uh, Manukian was briefly here at Camp Pendleton in Southern California. He traveled to Nicaragua uh, on some military action. He traveled around a little bit. But uh, most of the time, he was with McClellan. Uh, and he began sketching illustrations from McClellan's book. And he also began to make illustrations for uh, Leatherneck magazine. And when I went into microfilm in 1924, 1925, 1926, there were all kinds of uh, doodles like the tropical topics, you know, with the parrots that you see at the top, historical illustrations along the line of what he was doing for McClellan, and these kind of black and white pen and ink drawings, like he'd been trained to do uh, in Rhode Island, uh, were very, very popular in Leatherneck. I found that little illustration in uh, Leatherneck. It's a self-portrait that Manukian did in 1925, and I couldn't help comparing it with an Armenian uh, illumination you know, of a, a scholar at work as his desk. Somehow in my mind, I think Manukian, you know, saw himself as a scholar illustrator in this tradition. It's just, the, the two images go together uh, far too well. So in 1925, uh, Hawaii was probably uh, one of the best military posts you could get as an American uh, Marine. And when McClellan was transferred to uh, Honolulu, Manukian went with him very, very glad to go. And he was stationed at Pearl Harbor. Uh, if you try to imagine Hawaii in 1925, oddly enough, I think it had some things in common with Constantinople. It was a port city. Uh, you know, uh, air, air travel was just beginning to, to come along, so people really arrived via ship. It was also a place where there was a culture that was overseen by another dominant culture. You know, the Americans had taken over from the native Hawaiians. Uh, I think Manukin had a sensitivity about that, about that, that uh, feeling of colonization. And of course, it was also a very, very diverse place with uh, all kinds of people coming through Honolulu. So there you have a picture of King Street in Honolulu in 1925. Manukin would work near that street very soon after that photo was uh, taken. Very, very exciting place, and even during Prohibition, you know, you could get alcohol under the table in, uh, in most of the restaurants. And by the way, Gregory, you mentioned alcoholism. Manukian did develop into an alcoholic in, uh, in Honolulu, if he wasn't before. He had a very, very good uh, military record, except for once he uh, had to pay a fine for leaving his post without uh, permission. We wondered if drinking was involved there. There's a cover he did for the Pearl Harbor Weekly in 1926. And you can see it's kind of a fantasy image of Hawaii. It, it goes back to the days of sailing ships. Uh, but it shows the sailor with the two bare-breasted girls that really look like European women, not like Hawaiian women. But it's kind of a pen and ink fantasy. And that must have made it very, very popular to draw things in, uh, in that style. If you want to think about what was Hawaii in this era, uh, the steamships from the, the Matson Company, you know, we're bringing people, boatloads of people into Hawaii, and of course the travel companies were beginning to paint Hawaii as a uh, paradise. It's also interesting to tell you that uh, the Big Pink Royal Hawaiian Hotel, which is still down there on Waikiki, very popular hotel, opened in 1927. So Manukin came to Hawaii at an inter interesting time. Hawaii still had a lot of the flavor uh, that the native culture brought with it, but tourism and that the military installations were beginning to change all that very, very rapidly. There was a drawing Manukian did for Leatherneck in 1925 that shows a military plane uh, transporting Marines. And I put it there with a picture of the Pan, Air, Pan Am Clipper landing in Hawaii. There actually wasn't uh, air service to Hawaii until 1935, four years after Manukian uh, died. So in 1927, Manukian got his uh, discharge from the Marines, 
and uh, joined the Honolulu Artists Association. And there were maybe a handful, eight to ten, very serious, well-trained artists in Honolulu. They all knew each other. It was a very, very small town. And I also have a record that in the fall of that year, with the association, he heard a lecture by Madame Rivera, who had come from Paris, and she lectured about Paul Gauguin. And of course, people often say to me, Manukian looks like Gauguin, and I think there was a lot of borrowing at that idea of the, uh, you know, drawing the fantasy of uh, a Polynesian culture. Here are some of the paintings you could have seen in Honolulu before Manukian got there, and there were already painters that were making a very, very good living painting Hawaii. Uh, this man, Jules Tavernier, was called the Volcano Painter. Volcano paintings sold very, very well. D. Howard Hitchcock had a studio downtown, and most of the well-to-do tourists would buy a picture of a grass hut, or a hula girl, or a, uh, a sunset over the ocean. Manukian became friends with John Melville Kelly, who did uh, hotel uh, illustrations, he illustrated menus, and he worked as a commercial artist at the Honolulu Star Bulletin, and became a friend of Manukian's when Manukian got a job there as a newspaper artist. So there's the first Manukian painting, Tropicalia of uh, 1927. And I have to tell you, a painting like that looked very, very bold in 1927 especially in, in uh, you know, the United States. And I have here a little bit of a review that came from a show that Manukian did in early 1928. This is a positive review. People always didn't say positive things. But this artist, Don Blanding, praised Manukian for strong, vibrant color, which isn't garish. Fantastic abstract form, dramatic composition, and he says these are the positive qualities of Manukian's work. Other people were really put off by the color. And Manukian actually wrote a, a newspaper column around this time explaining to people that he didn't want to stagger them with his color. He kind of apologized for his color. But that's, he built his reputation over time for uh, color. With his friend Arthur Green, who was also uh, a newspaper man, the director of the fine arts section, he began to explore Hawaii. And he spent a lot of time on this trail, which is the trail up to Manoa Falls. And that uh, appeared in a painting he did in uh, 1928. But he was very, very taken with Hawaii. He told the magazine Paradise of the Pacific that he didn't understand why Hawaii wasn't just crammed with artists. He really felt it was an artist's paradise, uh, literally. He did quite a bit of sketching. He liked to sketch down by the waterfront and uh, sketch boats. All of that academic training he'd had at, in Rhode Island and New York really, really came through, I think, in his drawings, which are very, very accurate and very, very sharp. He was also uh, doing work for McClellan, who now had become the editor of Paradise of the Pacific. And Paradise of the Pacific was a beautifully illustrated magazine that eventually became Honolulu Magazine. So Manukin had this background in doing historical illustration, and he did those in pen and ink for Paradise of the Pacific. He also did uh, covers like this one. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when you leave today, by my uh, book table in the back, I have a framed cover with a Manukian on it, this same one from, uh, this may have been printed after he died, because they kept and reused a lot of his illustrations. There's a picture that they uh, printed after his death called Hawaiian Traders from 1937. Mm -hmm. So the way that he really got his career started, if you think about it, is a commercial artist, then he becomes a newspaper artist and also a magazine illustrator. And I think around 1928, something changed for Manukian. For one thing, he left his job at the newspaper. And it may have been that he was having trouble getting along with people because he was a very fiery personality. But he also told his friends he wanted to become a fine artist. And my feeling is that, is that Hawaii made him an artist. That's why I like to compare him to, to Van Gogh because I tell people, Van Gogh became an artist when he went to Arles in the south of France and thought he was going to find the New Japan. Of course, he found France, but uh, that really changed Van Gogh. And I think that's what happened to Manukian. I think Hawaii changed him. And his color blossomed, his subject matter broadened. And there's something about his paintings in 1928 and 1929, they became bolder and more abstract and more stylized. He began to work with Hawaiian mythology, 
like this image he did of Maui snaring the sun. And he found a very, very important collector. And I'd love to give a lecture just on this woman if there was more information available, but I'm going to give you the short version. Uh, Manukian came to the attention of Helene Irwin Crocker Fagan. And she was one of the wealthiest women in America. And she wasn't just wealthy, she was stupendously wealthy. And her story was that her father, uh, Mr. Irwin, I've forgotten his first name, had been a sugar baron. He made a tremendous fortune in the 19th century in sugar. And one of the stories I've heard about him is that his business partner won the island of Molokai in a poker game with a Hawaiian king. Now, I have to look on the internet, but there's apparently something to that story. It does involve the, the poker game. The water rights to Molokai and then the, the, the right to raise sugar cane in Molokai. Anyway, she was fabulously wealthy. Then she married the heir to the Crocker Railroad fortune in California. And uh, their mansion in San Francisco, their home is still there. It's a girls' school now. But they, they both brought tremendous fortunes. He turned out to like men better than women. So the marriage fell apart. But together, while they were together briefly, while she was a Crocker, they collected modern art. And this is a portrait that uh, Alexander Archipenko did of her in the late 1920s. She was a flapper. You know, she was a high society woman. There's a story about her that during the Great Depression, uh, a, a mink worth $12,000 was stolen from her Lincoln Continental. You can imagine a $12,000 mink in the Great uh, Depression. But she uh, remarried after she left Mr. Crocker. She married Paul Fagan, who was a San Francisco financier, and they were building a home in Honolulu. And she came there, and the story is that one night she was at the Hawaii Theater, and I just found this picture of the interior. The Hawaii Theater was a place where big musical numbers were done, and they had a neoclassical mural up above the proscenium. She and a friend named Muriel Damon uh, visited the, uh, they saw a musical at the Hawaii Theater, and afterwards they went out for drinks. And they went for drinks at the Green Mill Grill. Well, the Green Mill Grill was a speakeasy. And Manukian had been trading paintings to the owner, who was a Greek named George Gerasimus. Uh, he'd been trading paintings for food and booze for years. So this man had Manukians all around this uh, restaurant on Bethel Street. And he was about to close the restaurant and move to another location. And the story goes that the two society women saw these Manukian paintings and bought everything on the walls in one night. Just the two of them wrote a check. And the paintings basically stayed in those two families then for another 60 or 70 uh, years. And you know, I, I tell people, maybe they were drinking a little bit, but you imagine they'd been in the Hawaii theater under this neoclassical mural, and they came in and saw these bold, you know, fantastically colored uh, pictures and fell in love with them. So here are some of the pictures that they bought that had been around the uh, Green Mill Grill. One of them is this picture of the arrival of Captain Cook. And this was a favorite. I think Manukin did a couple versions of this. There, there are several versions of this he did. But you can see his drawing is there underneath, but he's using that very, very bold, strong color with strong outlines. So the painting is very, very graphic, uh, very easy to read. This painting was bought by Muriel Damon, Hawaiian boy and girl. And I tell people it's a little bit like a Byzantine Adam and Eve. You know, it has that strong, rich color of uh, Byzantine art, a little bit of Art Deco about it. But I think that Manukian had, had seen French painting when he was in New York. He had seen Matisse and Gauguin and other modern painting. This picture, Red Sails, is now on loan to the Honolulu Academy. It's one of the few Manukians you can see in public. And, and again, I think when most people saw that kind of color in the 1920s or 1930s, it looked absurd. You know, they couldn't imagine real, serious painting done with those colors. And I realized after looking at it for a while that the colors in some ways have a lot uh, in common with the Armenian flag. <laughs> the red and the blue and the gold. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a set of colors that any Armenian would be very, very at home with, very familiar with. This is Mrs. Fagan's uh, ranch home. They had several homes all over Hawaii. One of them was a, uh, a ranch on Molokai. But with this very sophisticated interior, they had these Manukian paintings all around the uh, Fagan Ranch. And the paintings and, and pictures of the interior were published, unfortunately, in black and white you know, in, the, uh, in the 1930s. But all of their wealthy friends saw the Manukian paintings. 
I understand there was another Manukian collector who was a famous uh, silent screen actress. I don't know her name, but you know, people. This is where Manukian got his reputation was through being part of the Fagan <coughs> collection. Here's another picture bought by uh, Mrs. Damon, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you the, the price for this painting. This painting sold in a private sale a few years ago for half a million dollars. So even though you know none of us have heard of Manukian, you know only in Hawaii people bought <coughs> these paintings. They bring exceptional prices, and the people say that that's one of his most uh, most beautiful paintings. This is another one that belongs to the Damons. It's inspired by Japanese art. I'm sure you know that a lot of modern artists looked at uh, Japanese art and borrowed the flatness of uh, Jap Japanese art. Amazing, beautiful blues and greens in that picture. He uh, began to work around his neighborhood. He lived in this neighborhood for a while. And he had very, very, what he called scientific color theories. You know, if, if you uh, read what his friends have to say about him, they called him the most scientific artist in Hawaii. And that's maybe because he had to justify the bright color. He would talk about color theory and the spectrum and the way that colors work together. And you can see he laid down stripes of color, one next to each other in the trunk of that tree, different colors, blues and golds in the windows of the house. This area now, the, the, uh, the channel at Alley Y, is all built up with skyscraper condominiums. You know, but in 1928, there were still these Hawaiian houses on stilts down by the uh, canal. That's from 1929. Uh, Mrs. Fagan's uh, cousin worked with Gumps in San Francisco, and she got Manuki in his only one-man show. Uh, the building where he had the show, now it's Louis Vuitton in uh, Waikiki. But he apparently had this one-man show that to help him sell more paintings. He was supporting himself now entirely by being a painter. Some of his best paintings come from that era. In a very, very decorative, uh, elegant painting of Hawaiian men and women. But there are also stories about his uh, mental troubles in this era. And this is a painting that just appeared about three months ago. It had been in the same family since the late uh, 1920s. And I want to tell you the story of this uh, painting. The grandmother of the woman who owned this painting until recently rented Manuki in a room that he was using as a place to live and also a, a studio. And the story goes that uh, she lived upstairs, he lived downstairs, and one night she heard a great clamor. And she came down and Manukian had destroyed all his paintings. He had had a uh, tantrum and had just, uh, you know, destroyed everything. He was very apologetic when she found him. You know, he calmed down, was very, very sorry, and they cleaned up the apartment together. And while they were cleaning it up, they found this painting behind the dresser. And he gave it to her as a gift. Wow. And that's how the painting remained in, in that family. There's another family in Honolulu that has this Manukian watercolor of a Hawaiian uh, man, and you can see it's torn in half. Mm -hmm. And apparently he had these pinned up for display, and he tore it in half uh, while his friends were there. But he was kind of known for these explosive tantrums. Uh, one story I tell in the uh, book, uh, I, I did find one woman in Honolulu who remembered Manukian. I found a woman who had taken an art lesson with him when she was seven years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she painted the coral trees near Black Point with him. But she told me that one day, they were, he was very, very nice. He gave her a painting tin and gave her her own palette that she was allowed to keep. But another day, he got very, very angry at her and he picked her up by the hair. <laughs> and again, you know, Gregory, you talk about what happens to people that have been through tremendous stress. You have to wonder what happened to him as a young man that he would pick up uh, a child by the hair. So a few more paintings from the late, maybe 1929, 1930. A beautiful large painting from the Damon Collection of Hawaiians making poor. And again, you have to love the, uh, the fantasy of all this. You know, the red coral tree, the blue-green banana leaves, the, uh, you know, the naked Hawaiians. Fantastic decorative uh, painting. This painting on paper belongs to Manukian's relatives in France. It's one of the few things that were sent back there after his death. Uh, I think that's one of his finest paintings. Shows the chiefs in their feather capes. You know, something about uh, Manukian, and I'm, I'm kind of uh, making an assumption here, 
you know, I, I don't really know if this is right, but I really think he had a tremendous sympathy for the Hawaiian people. I think on the one hand, he was very, very proud of being an American and an American Marine. And in fact, in his book plate, he shows himself as an American soldier that he kept in all his books. But you really feel a great sympathy for the Hawaiian people. He always painted them with tremendous uh, dignity. And I think he had that sense of a culture that, uh, let's say they had had their Byzantium. They had had their golden past, and he understood how that was changing. Here's his vision of uh, a shaman. Uh, this apparently was painted from a picture of an old woman. They, they have male and female uh, shaman in, in Hawaii. And he painted her as a Pele, the Hawaiian goddess of fire. So by 1930, you know, the, the crash had happened on Wall Street. And what people tell me is that it came to Hawaii more slowly. When it came to the mainland United States. There was still tourism. It just it took a while to uh, reach there. But apparently, selling paintings was getting harder. Uh, work gradually began to get scarcer. So I'm sure that that stressed Manukian and his friends. He was still getting newspaper coverage. He was still getting uh, good press. But you can see a change in his paintings. The painting on the left is by Manukian, of a Hawaiian woman weaving a uh, mat. The painting on the right is by, is by a woman that some people say was his girlfriend, a woman by the name of uh, Verna Talma, who had come from uh, San Francisco. And you can see they painted the same woman. And what I notice about the two of them is that Manukian has now gone from painting Hawaiian history and Hawaiian fantasy to painting a woman that's uh, very real. He's becoming, getting a more real view of the Hawaiian people. And when you look at these photographs of the family in 1925, or Hawaiian girls working in a, a pineapple cannery, you get a greater feeling of what's, what's the social reality of what's happening to the native Hawaiians in the uh, 1920s. You know, the island is becoming modernized and Americanized, and uh, you know, Manukian certainly noticed that transformation. His very last commission was for a place called the Waipahu Theater, which was over by where a lot of the uh, sugar was being harvested and uh, processed. And from one elderly man I interviewed, I I've never been able to see the murals because they've been covered up, the walls have been uh, redone, but he apparently did a small mural that was over one of the drinking fountains of this uh, theater. And it's very, very touching because when we interviewed, when I interviewed the Manukian family in France, uh, his aunt, who had passed away, had been told that he had done murals in the Honolulu Opera House, which had been bombed. And I think the truth is that he did a drinking fountain mural at the Waipahu Theater, which has shell marks from Pearl Harbor on the outside. So it's a little one of these things where maybe the story that the family got was a little bit uh, inflated. That's the last painting he did. He did that as a commission for a uh, wealthy man in uh, Oahu. And a few days after he uh, delivered it, he took his own life. Um, I'll tell you what I know about how he took his own life, and I'll also give you a theory. He was uh, renting a room from an architect and his wife. And uh, apparently when he died, he had been locked in his room for a day or two. He was having a depressive uh, episode, you know, possibly uh, drinking. And the guests outside in the living room were playing a parlor game. They were playing a game called murder. And they had invited him to take part, and he didn't. He had shut himself in his room, and he uh, drank photo developer and fell dead on the uh, kitchen door. And of course, I imagine that he said very, very little about his uh, past. You know, I've learned that, that the Armenian artist Arshil Gorky, of course, told people that he was Russian. He took Picasso's birthday when he came in at, uh, at uh, Ellis Island. Even Gorky's first wife didn't know that Gorky had been Armenian until after their divorce. And I think that uh, Manukian probably said very, very little about his childhood to his friends. And that's the, the shyness. That's why he was a puzzle to uh, people. So in a book that he'd given to his friend Arthur Green, there's this inscription in Manukian's handwriting. And I think if you read the spirit of it, it tells you something about how he saw the world. Art springs from the wild and anar anar anarchic side of human nature. Between the artist and the bureaucrat, there must always be a profound mutual antagonism, an age-long battle in which the artist, always outwardly worsted, wins in the end through the gratitude of mankind for the joy he puts into their lives. <laughs>
beautiful, beautiful uh, mm -hmm. statement. In uh, Europe, Manukian's brother Vahe was attending a seminary in uh, Marseille, living with his sister and his mother Agnes when the uh, news came. They had heard from Armand very, very little, so of course they were tremendously shocked. And about a year after the death, uh, Cyril Lemon came to uh, France to visit the family, and he brought two Manukian's paintings uh, with him. But no one really knows what happened to Manukian's library. He was very, very literate, left a large library behind. Um, I have seen some sketchbooks that he left behind with one family in Honolulu. And if you ever want to come see my archive, I have an archive of Manukian uh, sketches. That's the last photo of Manukian. And, you know, tragically, it probably was developed for the same photo developer that he drank when he took his life because uh, Cyril Lemon had a dark room downstairs. He was an amateur uh, photographer. And this was apparently taken you know, very, very near the end of his life. This is one more bit of writing. This is from a funeral uh, oration that his friend wrote. Manukian was chiefly a colorist. His was the dream of creating in color a great symphony of beauty. He would do in color what Beethoven had done in music. This was the dream of this anarchic uh, youth. And I like the saying, uh, we were talking about this before the presentation, that you know, in a great piece of music or a great work of art, there's both happiness and sadness. And I think that's what you find in, in Manukian's work. There's a tremendous sense of loss and uh, tragedy, and then there's that feeling of overcoming that uh, through the, the boldness and the color and the vigor of the artwork. It's all there in the painting, and it's part of what makes it, I think, heartbreakingly uh, beautiful. I'd like to take a moment for your uh, questions and hear your reaction to Manukian, and I'll tell you more. It's a little really long time. Did he mix his own paints? Pardon? Did he ever mix his own paints? I know he was very interested in the chemistry of paint because one, one book from his library that did survive is he has a uh, very, very nice 1930s handbook on paint mixing and has some of his, you know, a colors circle. I think he did grind some of his own pigment. But he was a very technical man. And he was proud of being a very, very scientific uh, painter. He was very careful about how he used paint. And there are Manukian forgeries out there. You know, it happens all the time when it's paintings becoming valuable. And I've seen some very, very bad forgeries. You can tell an authentic Manukian by the color because he used very expensive pigments and his colors are always perfect. And they're very, very well executed. They're, they're excellent technical uh, paintings. Yeah, I didn't know. How many paintings and sketches or murals are there? 31 oil paintings. And uh, it was 30 until about three months ago. You know, one shows up every now and then. 30 oil paintings, but hundreds of drawings because he illustrated a whole 800-page history of the Marines that was never uh, published. And when you leave today, I have a Manukian drawing that he did when he was staying with John Kelly at Blackfoot. It's a drawing of the beach, and it's in the silver frame as you leave, kind of by my book table. So I brought a Manukian with me. You see how beautifully he drew. A very fine, well-trained artist. Is there a very slight similarity between the profiles of the men he paints and his own? You know, I think that they say that every, port every portrait is a self-portrait. Yeah. Maybe an art. He, he, he drew himself a lot, and maybe he put himself into some of these features. I also had somebody tell me, where is it? And you can tell me, because you know better than I. Someone told me that the woman on the right, to them, posed like an Armenian bride would pose. And I don't know if that's a, you know, a valid comment, but I think his, his personality and his culture yeah. uh, came through. I also heard in one estate, one estate told me that they had disposed of a portrait many years ago that they think may have been his self-portrait. <laughs> uh, but they said it had a disturbing atmosphere about it, so they'd gotten rid of it. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, in one of your earlier slides, uh, uh, in describing uh, uh, Mrs. Fagan, yes. uh, I, you used the word uh, as patroness. Did you mean by that that she was assisting him financially? Well, she she was the biggest buyer of his artwork. She oh, and Muriel oh, Damon. Oh, and, and that's what, what you meant by patroness. That's what I meant by patroness. Yeah, and and you know it it you had to be adventurous to buy modern art. Uh, 
I, I, she knew modern art because she was a major collector. In fact, there's a room dedicated to her at the uh, Legion of Honor. In I didn't know whether I should have asked that yeah. question. No, no, no. no. Yeah, but uh, she... She was, uh, she was buying a lot of his work then. She bought his work and really made his reputation. Okay. Because there was a, there was a, uh, we'll say, a very elite high society in, mm -hmm. in Honolulu. And if you connected with that elite high society, your career was made as an artist. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Well, I'll tell you, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go sit at the back table, and I have books for anyone who's interested, and uh, you know, bring me more questions. And uh, I really appreciate your interest in Manukian. I brought my card, so if any of you want me to come and speak at an organization, uh, you know, let me know, and I'll uh, I'll be there. Thank you very much.